Um, <clears throat> uh, hi, hello, hi. Um, Abdullah Adam, so I work at Sony, uh, specifically within Sony Music, as a senior software engineer, mainly focusing on ML applications. And today um, we have our guests here, um, um, so Alberto and also Christina. So um, I'd leave them to also make introductions. So Would you like to start? Yep. Hello, my name is Christina. I work as an AI research engineer at a company called Small Robot Company. Uh, we develop robots for agriculture, and I am working on um, the um, uh, on machine learning uh, from all the data that we gather from the field. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm Alberto. I'm one of the co-founders of V7. We're a training data platform to uh, essentially generate training data, label training data, or observe the output of models in uh, specific workflows. So the pre and the post modeling side of uh, computer vision. Awesome, awesome uh, use cases. Um, so uh, talking about use cases, what sort of use cases do you use um, machine learning for in your organization? So at Small Robot Company, we, um, we work on per plant farming. So at the core for us is the object detection at the moment to identify each plant and then analyze what is the state of that plant and what type of plant it is, the different types of weeds or is it a crop and then what is the state of those, uh, of those crops. Uh, that is for the current state. In, in our more future um, research or the uh, new projects that we have is going to be multi-model approach, so incorporate other data as well to build um, the predictions from the state of the plants at the moment, what needs to be done to get better yield in the future on like per plant basis. Yeah, in our universe there's, um, given that we, we aren't the heroes in the journey, we're, we're part of their back end essentially, we get to oversee hundreds of projects at the same time and it's interesting to see where computer vision trends starts to emerge and then ebb and flow. Um, Agritech, for example, is one that is in, in, in full swing and there's more and more things that large agricultural companies are starting to collaborate with startups for. Um, V7 in particular does a lot of work in medical and life sciences um, industries. Uh, in the field of microscopy, for example, there's, there's millions of microscopes around the world and every time an eye looks at them, there's actually a computer vision task to be completed or technically it's a labeling task. You're looking at a cell assay and you wanna make a decision. And these happen hundreds of hundreds of times a day in, in analytical laboratories. Similarly, if you ever went to take any form of medical scan, that's technically a, a labeling task that a doctor is doing on, on your scan. Um, we're seeing these areas rise a lot um, I think we're seeing autonomous driving, for example, that used to push our side of the industry a lot um, in, in previous years, start to, to plateau a little bit more now that the promise of, of full autonomous driving starts to shift away from labeling tons and tons and tons of data and that big number of uh, millions of, of, of hours of, of uh, driving time into a more reasonable, okay, we need to you know, label cases which a refrigerator is falling off the back of a fire truck. Uh, this is a really valuable piece of training data. Um, so it's interesting to see to like how there's trends evolving and then there's technologies that are enabling a more programmatic uh, way of, of, of handling your training data and uh, yeah, maybe less generic computer vision, less people detection, less face detection projects and more this data only exists inside our business so there's no chance we can get something off the shelf and tune it. We need to do something from scratch. Um, in, uh, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, there's a couple of things to add. So to actually track um, how plants are growing, it's not enough just to take images of them. It's very important to have uh, the knowledge of the environment. What actually, what is the soil type that is in this given region or in this field? Uh, then the, how, how, how has the weather been going in the previous times? The history of the crop and then soil probes. So all this data, some of it, would, would be collected by us, but in some cases is actually incorporating the data from the other sources and then finding way to building this uh, multimodal models. Yeah. I, I think there's a theme developing around labeling. So uh, speaking of la labeling, especially with, for example, agricultural data, 
um, where, for example, the crop would like change over time. So how how do you sort of um, deal with that in your uh, both of your cases? Like, what sort of barriers do you see um, around labeling and data labeling and um, the sort of complexities? Like, what what sort of uh, barriers do you see essentially for your use cases? Um, so for us, the barriers around labeling is uh, training the annotators. It's, um, in our case, it's less about uh, the, the tools that we are using, though some tools are very helpful when you have active learning and so on. Uh, but it's actually having agri agronomists, field specialists, spending time on uh, building these um, guides for each growth stage, for different types of plants, um, and then later for diseases or some other conditions or the pests like uh, slugs or aphids. And we also need to see them, understand them, and then uh, explain this knowledge to the annotators and then continuously provide feedback and validate that this data is good uh, because, as you know, your models are going to be only as good as your data is. Yeah, I think we're, we're seeing similar things where uh, the, the in, increasingly more and more teams, are two trends that we've been seeing. One is in-house labeling teams or small squads where like the really critical data or the review of your data gets done by people that are sometimes even full-time employees of a specific company. And in a way, they're, they're sort of, it's similar to, to how software QA is something you bring in-house eventually to, to make sure your software doesn't, doesn't break. Um, you might want to have an in-house labeling team that just is the last line of defense between your model being terrible and, and your data being clean. Um, and then most people tend to outsource a lot of the, 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 the run-of-the-mill labeling, and there's always that challenge of, of them making mistakes. Uh, we've seen in and outside of ag tech, people kind of having labelers review the output of a model directly. Um, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. The like insect taxonomy is a really interesting one because there's, there's, there's tons of, of potential pests that you can see, and there's you know companies that have little cameras inside like insect traps to see in advance before what, when you might be seeing your your next uh, plague, your next in invasion of insects. I'm not sure what the, what the term is, um, but then it, it, it's a really interesting space because there's occlusion cases with leaves overlapping one another. Uh, there's instancing issues because you know weeds tend to grow very close to one another so uh, do you there's labeling challenges like do you do you label it with a polygon or do you, you want to put a key point in the point where there's a root and there therefore if you're using like a stomping robot that's the the part you want to hit um, so I think it's a really fun environment the ag tech part in general and then there's the there's a non there's a moving side of, of ag tech with, with animals um, and I think in the last for years, there's been a lot of companies, both startups and, and some of the ag agricultural giants go into animal welfare with with AI. Um, there's, you know, it, it can go all the way to monitoring animals that are free range, to, to monitoring the, their health, to kind of veterinary cases. Um, and it's interesting because it starts to be sort of the, the same stuff that you do in, you see in sports analytics, uh, in AI gets done now on, you know, cows to make sure that they're, they're healthy or not. That's really, um, that's, th those are really interesting use cases, especially grads to um, labeling. Um, so um, along the theme of labeling um, and also the challenges that you've discussed, what sort of uh, research areas these, uh, do you think should be the big focus? Like, or I would say probably not along the, like you could choose, it's open-ended, so maybe along labeling or, um, so what sort of research areas do you think should be the main focus of deep learning research um, in the near term, let's say, like, and how, how, how do you think it should, um, it should, they should, do you think also there should be more collaboration between industry and research, and how do you think that should happen? You want to go first? I'll, I'll take it. Um, I think industry is very underrepresented in, in research, of course, or in academia, let's say that. Um, and one of the, the reasons is that data sets, the like, great re industry data sets just don't find their way into the public domain as often. 
And sometimes when they do, they're just not that interesting from for, for like an academic that is trying to solve like a really big, hairy uh, deep learning problem uh, that has to try and the, kind of the, the, the almost AGI-like uh, uh, problems. Um, but yeah, otherwise, I covered this in, in a talk earlier today. There's not a lot of research being done on what happens if I change my, I'm biased, we're a company that deals with training data, so I'm gonna talk a lot about labeling, but uh, what if it changed the structure of my labels, my taxonomy, what if I uh, make this a, a two-stage model that first detects uh, you know, the type of plant, say, and then as an attribute, the species, does it work better than something that has a much wider flat uh, classification system? Um, what happens if I make a looser box around my plants and then I speed up labeling so I have more resources to create more data? What happens if I take a model that is so-so and then I run it through you know, a million images that I easily collect with a drone and then I auto-label all of them and then just do quality review on like say half of them? So all these techniques that involve not the changes of a model and a model's architecture but a change of the training data aren't really well documented in research um, or like there's very much fewer papers where people try to do these types of, of uh, transformations on the data set rather than on the model itself. Um, there's good reasons for why, like you're not going to do your, your, your PhD thesis on like, hey, I labeled data differently. Mm -hmm. um, but from an industry perspective, that's the stuff that is usually most accessible without having to wait for the next NeurIPS conference or, or whatnot to, to try something new. Yeah, so coming a bit further away from just um, uh, computer vision, um, in general, how deep learning research is evolving. So I think one of the reasons is, is uh, one of the areas is like hot topics. Whenever we have a breakthrough, uh, like when we had GANs, oh, everybody was doing GANs, then we've got uh, GPT-3 models. A lot of people are jumping on that. Now we've got stable diffusion, like all the diffusion-based latent diffusion stuff uh, with DALI. Um, and yeah, uh, a lot of people turning art, their attention to these areas, which is nice. Um, but uh, then there are some areas that are being more left out and they are still uh, useful and necessary. So for example, things like, um, especially for the companies, we have, um, often the training data, and then we have the real data, and there is a big data shift. So, so the research, there is research in um, mitigating this out of distribution shift, but um, neither the companies know much about it, nor there is enough research uh, in, in this area. Or if there is research, it's like, it's quite limited, people don't know as much about it. So if you look in, across the papers, it's mostly about yeah, new methods, new, new variations to the models, um, and not necessarily to these, uh, to these questions. Uh, now there is also a lot, a lot of research into fairness, um, which, which, which is good, which is something that has been brought by the concerns of the end users. So it is bringing kind of the research closer to, um, to, to the community of the end users. But I think all of it is quite fractured. Um, and so some of it is dictated by the success of the research itself and also by the availability of the data. So um, if there is data, researchers have, it, uh, have, it, have an easy time. Don't have, they don't have to spend time collecting it. Uh, all the resources they have, they can um, work on what is available and uh, improve the methods themselves. And as you were saying, that sometimes the industry uh, data is not as interesting for the researchers. Uh, so if they just put out the data, it kind of dies out. Um, so sometimes it's actually Kaggle competitions that bring the hype up. Um, and sometimes, um, actually, if companies internally start do, to do that research and uh, some initial research, and then they release the data set, but they frame it in a problem that is not just for this data set, but a wider problem, then it's easier to uh, involve the community that, like, yeah, let's, let's work on this because it's interesting. And it's not only relevant to this tiny specific area for this company, but it's actually more relevant to broader community. Yeah, I think there's maybe even less fairness the more data is is available. Uh, I think you can see it in sort of the diffusion models, for example, trained on the wider internet. They're really hard to debug and to, to try and avoid them making sort of embarrassing results sometimes. Um, yeah, I, I think we've also, 
maybe on the topic of research, we've pretty much taken the route of gradient descent and then just like went 1,000 miles an hour as far as we possibly could. And we're, to be honest, it's, it's still a car that's running. Like with the, if you've seen like action transformers lately, there was a demo from, from the, the folks at Adept. It's the, the authors of the uh, Attention is All You Need paper. They're awesome and they keep doing things that just surprise people and the more they surprise people, I think the more young researchers go into the field and they push the concept of gradient descent further. Um, there will come a time which you're gonna have to backtrack and probably rethink that, but maybe we still have another couple of years of, of that, maybe a couple of years of transformers being being still the uh, Max Verstappens of uh, AI, uh, AI conferences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, I also share that as well. Like, I believe, I think we have sort of um, tunnel vision into uh, backprop as uh, so gradient descent appro uh, approaches essentially. So each sort of deep learning or machine learning, deep learning problems, especially like tend to be like you'd have to frame that as a um, gradient descent problem, um, which is good because like a, uh, a lot of GPUs can compute uh, gradients quite quickly and um, update weights and like that's where we like where, where we get a lot more uh, speed of running experiments like um, compared to like other approaches like um, evolutionary algorithms which sort of died out immediately pretty much like I would say in the <laughs> from the research labs because they are a lot more compute in intensive. So um, yeah, so that's interesting. So you mentioned um, uh, like along the lines of con uh, collaboration, um, uh, what sort of um, what sort of ways do you see um, research being moved into um, industry like application and how do you think it should be operationalized? Like, um, what sort of processes do you see? Like, uh, would you recommend, like, um, in, in general? Um, so, I, I don't really like to completely separate uh, research and industry, and uh, it is they they are integrated in big companies like in google and um in uh, in hp in uh in in in, in all the fair um uh, in, in all the fan companies and, and many others but then smaller companies also have uh, their research integrated with um like some research done alongside with the development and the production so i think the more this happens uh, the uh, the more research would be um, um, directed by the needs of the company, uh, and at the same time, the um, the those on the business side would be exposed uh, to 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 the to the develop to the new developments and understanding actual uh, machine learning better. Um, what? Like one of sometimes companies don't have enough uh, resources to have a research facility. So a good way is to collaborate with the universities, and there is a plethora of different programs, finance co-financed by the government or just by the organisations to bring together the academic research together with the, with the industry. And, uh, and sometimes these are internships. So someone is doing an internship after their master's program or during PhD, after PhD. So these placements are very good for the academics to understand whether they actually want to go into um, uh, the industry or want to stay with academia. Um, yep. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And, and I think it, it's nice to have this proper distinction between like what research should bring to us and what should expect from it. And from I think a lot of industry is, is turning more and more the field into an engineering one than a research one, and I think that's good. Uh, if you think like in 2015, if you were training an image, image in a classifier, you were probably a researcher or you called yourself one. If you're doing it today, you could be like a 13-year-old with some collab credits. Because the, the field is shifting a lot and things are getting easier and commoditized, and that's good. And I think what research should focus on is like, the collaboration with industry is important, but industry will always sniff out opportunities and pick them up. Um, but like we should, 
there's probably two areas of people working on the fundamental stuff and they're working on, you know, more toy data sets, things that are, are, are not super applicable to industry. And then on the other side, there's people that are sharing the experiments that they're doing to build a better recommendation system, build a better, uh, even stuff that we can consider to be a commodity, like how do you, how do you classify uh, states of weather in, in, in better and better ways um, through a simple classifier. Uh, or in, in the medical field, for example, you, you tend to go for things that are tried and tested and, and safe approaches, and then you, you share these little tweaks. And that's kind of this sort of applied research area where, where it's nice to have like industry leaders come in and share, hey, this is how we, we worked on this internal data that we have, this is the approach that we, we tried. Um, but I think it, it's good to have the fundamental stuff continue to be wild and, and work on problems that seemingly have no industry application because eventually they, they will, they, yeah. people will just try them. Yeah, yeah I agree. Uh, um, and I like the point of also, uh, I think a lot of companies uh, have um, like research teams embedded within um, their, um, their own companies. So like, for example, at Sony also, we have Sony AI and a few other like uh, brands that are sort of like more focused towards research. Um, and also like coming up with new ways to, so I guess that's one way for like the approach you described for embedding researchers within the industry and seeing what, uh, so I guess there's like two approaches where one is like embedding researchers into companies and then the other is like um, just allowing researchers to, um, in, the, in academia to essentially um, explore and then come up with uh, uh, new ML algorithms. So in um, along those lines, do you see any, um, do you think there's as much overlap between what researchers in academia are working on and what needs, what the industry needs? Or what do you, like in the cases where, for example, um, like what do you think, uh, do you think researchers should focus more on like um, problems within the industry or what sort of, what, what are your thoughts? I think depending on like this crowd, for example, is probably going to be more interested in, in applied problems, I suppose. I mean, at least given the sample that I've spoken to so far, if you go to CVPR, for example, still like computer vision bias here, but a lot of people are working on more applied stuff um, if you go to NeurIPS, they're trying to do more blue sky thinking. And I think that it, it, it's fine this way and the collaboration is, is definitely there. Um, research inside a company makes sense if that company has a ton of data internally that they hope to get some ROI out of. But I think it makes less sense when the company is trying to build a brand new product through AI. And, and I think we've seen like FANGs create the purchase super popular academics and then give them a job and then some most of the time it hasn't really worked out. Um, they've attracted talent internally and that was the primarily their job. But sometimes this talent has sometimes led to some some amazing um, advantages based on the data that the company was already producing. If it was a social media company it was probably you know, gathering a lot of pictures, texts and, and, and so on. Uh, and then there's been some other areas where it's like, oh, we'll, we'll create this brand new AI product internally within the company and these have tended not to work. Um, and so I think if, if you're doing research internally, if you're hiring researchers, make sure that there's, unless you wanna do it primarily for the sake of, of sponsoring research, um, having like a, a huge corpus of data internally where even if you improve a process by 5%, there's a massive ROI, then by all means like, uh, hire as many people as you can. Uh, if not, it can be a bit tricky because as we know AI products are actually really hard to commercialize. Um, despite them being super cool, you're basically doing a, a great demo that you, you then have to try and sell and you have six months before that thing starts to become obsolete. Uh, so that's the challenge of, I think, a lot of internal projects that are for productization. Well, you're saying that these, um, this research that has been taken internally to the companies hasn't worked, but it's research. Mm -hmm. That's like yeah. the definition. It's high risk investment, and most research does not work. 
Obviously, we don't publish paper of stuff that didn't work, but most stuff does not work out. That is the point of research, of, build, of bringing it further and uh, evaluating at the steps where it fails and then either taking a different direction, changing the hypothesis, or uh, seeing that it's not, it cannot be moved forward at the given, um, at the given state and do something else. Um, I do think that uh, researchers should be given as much freedom as they can <laughs> um, to, in, in, in pursuing the research. So, for example, um, the stuff that we saw yesterday with um, uh, Michael Bronstein presenting a new approach to doing graph neural networks is physics inspired and you might even get, just get rid of uh, backpropagation. You, you won't need it and it will be much more efficient. Uh, and yeah, in the end the companies will need it, they will want it uh, because it's more efficient, you don't need as much computation. So, um, I mean, you're also helping the environment, so you use less of the computation. Uh, and it's also faster and uh, maybe better accuracy, so that's awesome. Um, and I think there should be more presentations like that where the, those who work on the fundamental research would say, hey, we made breakthroughs here and here, and so this most likely will be your next future. So here's the information in the boiled down, down level, and then uh, your um, like engineers or like data scientists might take a look at this and see how they might implement it for their use cases. Um, and I think we are going to be hearing a lot more um, about quantum machine learning, quantum computing. It was really great to hear your presentation today, and I have mostly heard about it in the context of um, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, and many other different companies, but on the investment side. And uh, it might be our future reality uh, at some point. So if we would know more about it, if the companies would have um, like venues to hear about this theoretical research and plan ahead, um, how they can incorporate that um, as a vision um, or just as some experiments for the future, I think that would be quite good. Uh, yes, uh, speaking about um, taking um, essentially the future, what what sort of what do you what do you see as um, like the fruits of research making their way through um, the industry? What's so coming like, up? Like, uh, you know, for sure. Yeah, it's really obviously really hard to predict, but um, quantum computing. I hope like I wish there was um, you know a poll at the end of every kind of academic research in AI where people think the the evolution of the, the field is going to go. And it would probably look like, a, you know, like a jagged line because I think our allegiance has shift based on like tiny breakthroughs, which start with like really long hunches. And so going back to the, the concept of like transformers being like the, this car that we've been riding, um, for every thing that's working really well, there's this kind of counter culture that is, say, is trying Bayesian models or is trying uh, symbolic approaches, yeah. and we don't like we don't know. It's it's good to bet that something's going to come out of them, but it hasn't historically always happened. And deep learning itself was a very fringe group in you know the eighties and and whatnot. Um, so what what we can easily predict is that there's going to be more and more kind of general purpose automation. Uh, if if it's a task and talking in business term that can be solved like 80% accurately and then you're happy and then you can send it to a human for verif verification, then that's likely something that will increasingly be more of an off-the-shelf service. Um, if it's like another thing that we're seeing in the labeling space is like less and less we'll label a million images and more and more we need to find out you know, what the, what the, the failure cases here are. Um, we're going to be seeing and I'm sure you're probably surrounded by them, but many more SaaS companies that uh, advertise the use of AI, but a lot of them are just going to be wrappers around an API. Like there's been you know, hundreds of companies coming out of GPT being public. Now there's the stable diffusion model is out. So there's 100,000 apps that allow you to, to paint. Um, and I think that trend will probably continue. There's gonna be one company with a lot of money to train a ridiculously large model and then make it available and then people that try to commercialize it. And I think one part that I'm excited, this is completely outside of the, the research domain, is that um, a lot of the value unlocked by, by deep learning, I think, is, is, has a user experience problem other than just uh, a research problem. 
And so it's exciting to see how people will kind of use AI as a paintbrush, if you will, or as a way of, of copywriting or as a way of composing, uh, creating content uh, that's getting better and better. And I think on the sort of startup side, there's a lot of companies that with very little research investment were able to grow by just taking produced research and then commercializing it with a nice UX, uh, which is probably a good thing, um, even though, you know, didn't pay for any of that research, but still, it's a, it's a good run for them. Um, yeah, and um, I think we haven't addressed one elephant in the room, which is uh, reinforcement learning. Um, and it has, so it has been developing a lot as, um, as a research field, but also many companies try to implement it um, and apply it somehow to, to their problems. But it seems like everybody's trying to do that separately. And you know, when there is a gold rush, you better make your money not by like digging gold, but I, by actually producing the tools for that. So I think there is still absence at the market for the tools for companies to develop their um, simulated environments for these RL models. Like for example, you um, at V7, you work with labeling and labeling tools. So that is provided for computer vision, but uh, for and then any company can actually use them and easily incorporate them in the workflow. So for reinforcement learning, it would be nice to have tools like that uh, so that companies could experiment with their use cases, create their agents, create their environment, and then rewards um, and in an easy manner, and then try, is this, gonna to, is this going to work out for them? Um, so I think reinforcement learning is going to be another thing that's going to be developing, and we will see a lot more tools and companies sprouting around it. Yeah, and probably like I think a lot of of sort of this let's call it automation. It won't just be maybe RL in some cases, but it's we're going to see it happen on the internet before it makes its way in embodied systems. So if you think of the potential space of actions that you can take on Salesforce.com. It's much smaller than the ones you can take in a bathroom if you need to clean it. Uh, so potential edge cases are much smaller in the general internet. In anything you po could possibly do in the internet, uh, modeling that is a much smaller problem than like navigating this room and you know making coffee and simple things that for us are really really simple to do. So I think we will probably get like a model that can replace uh, an office worker before we can get a model that can replace a janitor um, and. But this is my my prediction here is personal. Um, yeah, and, and, and similarly, there's there's the hardware problem there. Like, it's really easy for us to do something that can navigate a website, but to build a robot that is light enough and can make its way in an embodied space is, is trickier. So maybe video games and internet first, probably internet first, video games second, embodied in, in the actual planet when maybe, maybe, who knows? Yeah, that's really interesting, actually. Um, and then um, I think speaking about uh, application, like essentially bridging the gap between res research and application. So, do you think uh, you spoke about tooling, like essentially tools for um, so you uh, like annotating, for example, and then we have tools now for reinforcement learning. So do you see, um, and these tools, uh, some of which are open source, or like you talked about a larger company training up, uh, which, uh, who have resources to train a lot of these really large models with billions of parameters, like, and then open sourcing that and then allowing others to use it. Do you think um, open sourcing and also open source, like, Essentially, the open source space is a place where, like, a lot of this collaboration could happen. Like, or, like, what do you sort of think about that space? Or, like, and also, especially, like, so do you see it as a medium, essentially? Um, so I would say when a company when a company is faced with a choice whether to open source something or to patent, they have risks. On one case, on one hand side they might engage the community if they open source something. Their product that they open source might become better because others are gonna engage with it and they will get the work for free. They will get the product that they now can use, which is much better than the stuff they have released initially. 
Um, and everybody else can use it as well. So it's a, a new tool on the market. Uh, well, actually not on the market, it's a new tool for free, uh, which, is, which is nice. Uh, on the other hand side, you can protect this, the, the, like, because this, um, this work has been uh, required a lot of resources and also the salaries for people that paid it and some consultants and whatnot. What, so there is um, an urge to, um, to actually create patents so that others are not going to use it um, and the company can secure um, value from these and uh, kind of fend off the competitors so that they are not using this same method. Um, and there is a trade-off between the two. And um, there has been more of the patenting logic in the business rather than open sourcing. Open sourcing is something is more for the um, info, more for like IT people that, that I use for it. So programmers, they're like, yeah, it's yeah, we do that. And the business people, what is that? Like we are giving something away for free. Um, so that mentality um, is something that needs um, more time to, uh, to 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 become something common uh, in in the mind of, of the people, also on the business side. Um, so yeah, open sourcing is nice. Uh, in our company, we do try to open source some things, um, but uh, it has to go through a rigorous process and then vetting and then well, decisions, what can be open source, what can be not, and what do we keep in the internal re repositories, what can be put in the external one, but we do see the benefit. Well, partially because our management has come from research side, so they see, they see this as a beneficial um, uh, thing to share from the community, to take from the community and, and give it back and give back. Um, but it's not as common everywhere. What do you think about open source? Yeah, I would agree. I think that's the mentality of a lot of larger businesses is like we'll open source to attract the community and to get talent in and to, to, to in a way give back. But I think more cynically it's to to just attract uh, attract talent and then do something that is not extremely competitive for them. And if you think about it, there's pretty much an open source version of almost any popular piece of software out there. And it's always an extremely small percentage of the market share. There's open source Slack, there's open source CRMs, there's open source everything. And I think the same will happen with, with deep learning products, uh, or, or well, obviously their, their frameworks are already, but um, I, I think it's, there's never been the, this many open source projects out there. And there's also never been this much kind of revenue coming from SaaS. So there's always going to be an open source option and a type of company that uses an open source tool. And I think it's like a healthy baseline. Sometimes it's even like some companies think of open source tools as moats to prevent other so like smaller incumbents to try and compete within the market because like, oh, you're competing with an open source, like smaller market shareholder. Um, yeah, so like I, I obviously, we can all agree they're they're fantastic. We we all base ourselves off of open source research and work. Um, are, is the field going to be taken over by by open source project? I don't think so because it's going to get more and more commoditized and just going to become regular engineering more and more. And that trend tends to have people prefer either a managed service or a hosted service or something with uh, with people behind it that aren't uh, the, the the open source community, simply based on historical uh, events. And then with that, uh, we'll start us up to like, getting questions from everyone. Okay. Uh, thank you very much again for listening. And also, thank you for thank you to the host as well, uh, my guest. <laughs> um, uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.